Welcome to the Microsoft IT Pro Podcast, a show about Office 365, Azure, and the IT Pro and end user side of life. Each week, we'll discuss a different topic or recent news related to Office 365 and Azure and how it relates to you as an IT Pro. The Microsoft IT Pro Podcast is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, Scott. How are you? <laughs> It sounds like I'm doing a little bit better than you are. Yes, we had the stomach bug plague hit our house um, the last couple days, and we had me and my wife and my four-year-old and my two-year-old all flat on our backs, and our one-year-old who felt fine thinking we all wanted to play with him. Yeah, you know, that's what what kids do. Yeah. (laughs) It's been a rough 36 hours or so, but I'm back on my feet. I'm thinking mostly clearly. So if I say anything stupid or I don't make sense today, I blame the sickness. Yeah, if I say anything stupid or do anything dumb, it's just because it's a normal day for me. (laughs) All right. All right. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So today we are going to take a trip back into Azure land and talk about one of the kind of foundational things that you'll run into in Azure, and that's Azure Storage. So we kind of want to talk about what's there in storage, and and not just for VMs, but you know in general what storage is, how you can use it, how you can leverage it, those kind of things. Give everybody a nice overview of what's sitting there. Yeah, exactly. Like you said, we we kind of touched on storage from that VHD perspective, VM perspective in one of the earlier episodes when we talked about Azure IaaS. But there is there's a lot more there when it comes to storage, using it for all kinds of different solutions. I know I actually use it in a few different ways here. So we'll kind of give that broad overview, like you said, of what is Azure Storage? What are the different ways you can use it? What benefits do you have from Azure Storage over some of the other areas in the cloud you might want to store stuff in. Cool, yeah. So let's go ahead and hop right into it and kind of talk about some of those foundations. So I I think the first thing everybody needs to understand about Azure Storage is, like any other cloud storage, object-based storage service, you're paying for durability within that platform. And the way Azure accomplishes durability within its kind of normal storage accounts is, is pretty interesting. So no matter what kind of storage you choose, because you're going to have all sorts of options, right? Even between, do I want locally redundant, zone redundant, geo redundant, whatever that happens to be. Say I go for like the lowest, hey, I just want my storage to be sitting here in East US 2. And that's the only place I want it to be. And you just say, I want it to be locally redundant. Well, even in that case, you still have three copies of the data, no matter what happens. So everything is highly durable on the back end. And that durability doesn't come with any kind of sacrifices based on cost or, or anything like that, right? I think we've talked in the past about how these cloud providers like Microsoft or Amazon or Google, they don't go to Best Buy and buy a hard drive. <laughs> they go to uh, you know China and buy like container ships full of them. So you're getting economies of scale that come across there. And really storage is a commodity service. So one of the things you run into is it tends to cost the same amount across everybody too. So say AWS comes out with a new storage tier or they drop a price on an existing tier, typically you're going to see Microsoft and Google come back and not only have an equivalent offering, but also match the price across it, right? Because it's not some place that, that you can compete on price. So beyond that durability and cost, it's also highly scalable, right? So if Microsoft's already making three copies of my data locally, well, what happens if I say, let's get outside a data center and get into a zone, or let's get outside of a zone and get into a multi-geo type of situation. So I'd like to have my storage replicated automatically with an SLA between East US 2 and US West. Really super easy, super turnkey, right? The other thing you've got to think about is uh, security for your storage. So Azure Storage supports everything from encryption in transit, 
to encryption of rest, encryption at rest, you can control things like encryption keys, should you choose to go down that path. And then even just the way we programmatically access storage. So whether it's the Azure platform and their service fabric doing it on our behalf for a VM, or it's an application that we've wrote that's using block or blob storage or something like that, just to do, you know, object-based cloud storage. You know, again, we we have a an API and access layer there with things like primary and secondary access keys and SaaS tokens and and a bunch of other things that that go into that. It is. It really it makes sense if you're going to do any type of storage that you want to be available a whole bunch of different places across the internet. Something like this makes a lot of sense. I mean, it doesn't to me. It doesn't make much sense anymore to try to stand up your own NAS that you make publicly available or like you said, go buy disks off. Off the shelves at Best Buy. I know if I could, I would get rid of every hard drive, every storage option in my house and just put it all up in the cloud for all of those reasons. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, if anything, just for that cost component, right? So, so that cost and, and, and durability is, is something that comes into play. Um, so one of the things that happens in storage is because it is a service and it's a consumption based service, you can consume different types of storage, or realistically different levels in there as well. So we've talked in the past about virtual machines and disk-based storage, so those are going to be VHDs that are sitting in blobs inside an Azure storage account, and the service fabric's kind of running everything through for us and, and making sure that that VM can talk to you know effectively that scale-out file on the back end in Azure storage. The other interesting thing that happens, so you mentioned NASes, there is a component Component of Azure Storage where I can go in and I can say expose an uh, SMB file share straight out of the storage account. So that's Azure Files. So it's the same storage account that your disks would be living in. Maybe it's just in like another folder container sitting next to it. But if you think about like really turnkey lift and shift scenarios, super easy. Literally click a checkbox and. Boom! You know you're up and running, and you have Azure Files, all without having to stand up a a traditional file server or anything else like that. So if you have applications that have shared storage needs that are hosted on a Windows platform or a Linux platform, they talk SMB. Hey, now you have a way to consolidate that in and really lock into just an, a nice, easy lift and shift kind of scenario. The other thing you can do there is just straight blob storage. So now we're talking true object based storage all accessed via API. So typically going to be a REST API or a wrapper around it in an SDK, things like that. Great for streaming, random object access scenarios, really anything like that. So if you take a Maybe we take like a traditional database, right? So I have you know my web application and I store profile photos for users. Well, in the past, maybe I stored those in my database as an image column, like in SQL Server, or maybe I even just took them and said, "Hey Ben, upload your profile photo," and it goes to a folder on a server someplace. Well, you know that was really hard to. Scale out because then I had to have kind of a shared storage thing. And if I was using SQL Server, you know, if I'm using images, I've got to serialize and deserialize them on on every time I want to get them in and out of the database and and see what's going on there. Uh, so really not that fun. So Azure offers this blob storage where I can go ahead and push objects straight into cloud-based storage and then just pull them out via API and again have access to kind of resiliency and cost benefits and all those kinds of things. So you know, if you had that 200 gigs of you know just random pictures or documents or whatever it was, let's just go ahead and write those out to storage. Get better durability, better recoverability, have the ability to snapshot, do all those kinds of things, and it's it's just sitting there ready for you to go. Yeah, I know. So blo- disks I've obviously used a lot with IaaS stuff. The files and blobs, both of those I use quite a bit. You mentioned files too, like that shared storage. And going back to even that consumption based, when you start getting into these files, I've also used these. Like we said, I'm a SharePoint guy. If I'm going to stand up a SharePoint farm in Azure now, instead of actually storing the install bits on any of the VMs, because now you are paying for consumption. So if I have a SQL ISO or the SharePoint bits sitting out on four different servers in a farm, I'm paying to store those four different times. 
I've started standing up file shares and I actually have a file share up in Azure with all of my installs that I may want to have installed on all of my servers. So I just download it once, throw it on this file share in Azure. Um, Then like you said, you just treat it like a normal SMB share. Access it anywhere, copy it over to the install, delete it off the VM, install it straight off the SMB if you want to. But that file share... I really like it. It's come in handy for a lot of different solutions when typically you would have to either share out a file on a or share out a folder on a VM or stand up a file server. Now you just kind of stand up this file storage that's your new file share up in the cloud between all your different VMs. I think one of the really cool things that you can do as long as you're within the you know the constraints and limits of the platform is now you can start to store all that stuff in the same place if you want to too. So your disks, your files, your blobs, it can all live next to each other. And then those storage accounts also support some things beyond that as well, right? So an Azure storage account also comes with two other kind of components to it. And those are tables and queues. So tables being no SQL storage, again, accessed via REST API. You know, there's tooling, Azure Storage Explorer, you can go in and go in and take a look at it, but a key value store. So you can go ahead and take things like Azure Diagnostics and have them write out to that storage account and actually write things like your event logs from your IaaS boxes straight into that NoSQL storage, where then you can go and query it and pull it out in, you know, say you wanted to visualize it in Inside of Power BI or, or or some other tool, or if you just have needs for kind of a light no SQL implementation, so so again that persisted key value store, super easy, super turnkey right there, and you're falling underneath you know that same durability and cost and and, and all those other things. Azure Storage also comes with a queuing mechanism. So uh, if you think about like a message queue and, and having access to a, a lightweight, reliable MQ, again, accessed via API, all that kind of stuff. Really great for if you're building applications that need to schedule any type of asynchronous tasking. It's just sitting there, all, all ready for you to go. To be honest, I haven't done a lot with tables and queues. It's one of those things that it's like, I really need to spend some time looking at those. But I haven't done a whole lot with them. On my list to go investigate, learn more about. If you do IaaS in Azure today, one of the easiest ways to get into kind of the value of at least tables without having to be a developer or anything like that is turn on some of the diagnostics in the platform that write to storage and then get access to that data and actually kind of understand not only the stuff that you're hosting, but also what the underlying service fabric is doing around your doing around all that kit that you stood up in whatever your scenario was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's kind of go and you know walk through these a little bit more. So you know we talked about blobs and kind of where they go. Those are great for, like you said, those data sharing scenarios. If you have any kind of like quote unquote big data needs and it's not going into another service like a data lake, things like that, it might be appropriate to go ahead and just have it stored over in that storage account because they scale super high, particularly in those scenarios. Great for things like backups, right? Right. If you are doing a not just like an Azure backup, but say we're doing like a SQL Server thing, well, SQL Server has native support to write its backup files directly to Azure Storage. So if I want to kind of skip the file system and go straight to the cheapest place and you know the most resilient and durable place, you know, quite often the tooling, whether it's an Azure backup or uh, like even that native stuff built into SQL Server, can go ahead and push us right out there, all, all, all ready to go. Yeah, and one of the other nice things too about Blobs is they have both these, I think it's the hot, do they call it hot and cool? I think it's hot and cool. Hot and cold, hot, hot and cool. Yeah. Hot and cold. It's like a Katy, Katy Perry song. Warm and, yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there. (laughs) You can do with the storage. So the hot storage is meant, again, for those blobs that you may be interacting with regularly, both reading and writing from. It's going to be that quicker storage that maybe you want to use if you are doing some of the data sharing or some of the big data stuff. But then they also have their, their cool or their cold storage that is... It's not going to give you that performance for reading and writing data. This is one of those that's perfect for... Like that backup scenario where you're writing data out to it, you want to have it in case you need it, but you're not going to be accessing it on a regular basis. Like you said, SQL backups, 
I know I said I want to get rid of NASs here, but I have a NAS here. I have a QNAP device here. I actually have it set up so it backs up to an Azure blob in the cool storage. So for like 40 bucks a month, I'm backing up, I think it's somewhere around three terabytes of data off of my local NAS up to a blob. So for me, it's cheap backup. It gives me a lot of storage. And again, going back to that whole resiliency, redundancy, I don't have to worry about it. If I ever lose my hard drives here, I hope it never happens, but the house burns down. All those files I have here, I know are backed up in those Azure blobs. And then you get a price break too. If you're going to do that cool storage, it's cheaper than the warm storage or the hot storage or the fiery storage, whatever we want to call it today. But you get that the price difference, that price break, if you're going to use cool storage. So as you're looking at these blobs too and what you're going to put up there, how it's going to be utilized, be aware that there are those two different storage mechanisms up in Azure blobs that you can leverage for those different scenarios based on the workload, the frequency that you're going to be accessing or reading and writing those files. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely good to kind of keep in the back of your head, right? Especially as you're looking to gain platform optimizations or operational or cost efficiencies or anything else like that along the way. You know, I think we've kind of taken a nice trip over the top with most of those. Let's take a dive because it's kind of our world a little bit over to disks specifically and VHDs and and some of the things that go on there. So, you know, you talked about storage tiers between, you know, stuff I need now with hot or warm and then that archival like like cooler storage. Even within that kind of you know, stuff I need today tier. There's other things that you can do with disks and particularly with VHDs to get better performance out of that platform and effectively consume a higher performance tier. So that would be Microsoft's premium storage offer and having the ability to do several tiers of uh, premium storage, either standard, standard or premium across those and then then how we manage the disks within them. So typically what happened in the past was Microsoft, you know, we used to talk a lot about, at least in the ASM days, when the platform first came online, everything was super slow because it just was, right? And everything was on, you know, spinning rust and we had this, everything was durable, but Man, you know, when you were talking a theoretical 500 IOPS per disk, if you had IO driven or high throughput workloads, it was really hard to push them into Azure on day one because you had to do a lot of work with striping your disks and putting things back together. Over time, Microsoft has added features to the platform like this premium storage, right? Where now we have access to SSD storage with much higher throughput and IO targets. So if you do have a high IOPS needs, super easy to get in there and have those uh, not just ephemeral SSDs, but persistent disks, right? So they're, they're going to be available every time our PC reboots, things like that. So in that case of that SharePoint server, right, where I stood up a, a meaty farm that had a number of requirements around search, you know, our typical IOPS requirements for search databases are anything between 4,000 and 7,000 IOPS. So that was kind of hard to meet in the older storage mechanisms and really get them to be in there and make them performant. The premium storage that SSD storage really has helped those VMs when you are looking for that extra speed boost. The one thing to be aware of too as you start standing these up is not all VMs actually support SSDs. So if you're if you're looking to do this premium storage, you've got to look for the series of VMs typically I think they keep adding them on so I haven't looked to verify all of these. They have an S in the series. So You have your DS series, you have your FS series, you have your GS series, those as opposed to like just your D series. So if you're looking to spin up VMs, if you're looking to use SSDs, make sure you get one of those DS series, FS series that support SSDs. The other thing I would say is if you look through these two, even from a pricing perspective, a D series that just supports standard storage is the exact same price as a DS series that supports SSDs. And just because you stood up the DS series doesn't mean you have to use that standard storage. So my rule of thumb lately for any VM I stand up, I always stand up the DS series or the FS series so that if I need to, I can attach SSDs to them. I can attach the premium storage. So with those, you can still start with standard storage, 
on a DS series. And if you need the performance later, you have the option to add premium storage to it. So again, just one of those things to be aware of as you're looking at that. What you need to do if you want to leverage some of that premium storage. It's one of those things where you do have to be careful, right? And, and we used to run into this in the past. It's not just the types of storage you can attach and and in the past, you still run into it today. It's also things like the number of disks that you can go ahead and attach to a VM too, right? So if I choose that lower tier, I might only be able to attach two disks to it. And if I do happen to have to stripe them, then I only can stripe two disks. Where if I go into some of those higher series, I might be able to attach 32 disks and stripe across all of those. But then stepping down becomes harder because now I can't step down into a lower tier because disks are there and now it's all a little bit weird. So you nailed it with the premium stuff and, and look for that S in the series name. The other important thing to keep in mind is when we talk about premium storage, they only support Azure disks today. So if I have any additional I.O. needs around things like regular blob storage, I can't go out and say, hey, purchase a storage account, but make it a premium storage account, and I want to store blobs in it. It's I'm always going to have that premium storage associated with an IaaS workload, either you know a Linux or a Windows. Windows virtual machine, things like that. And then, you know, one of the things you also have to know is to get into the right tier of premium storage, because, you know, there's a bunch of tiers, right? Uh, so if I get in, you know, there's like what P10s, P20s, P30s, I think it goes all the way up to like P5s, right? The P50s. They all have different not just disk sizes, but also I.O. targets per disk, and then throughput targets per disk as well, right? Maybe I go into like a P10, and that's still a lower IOPS, and it only comes with 100 megs a second for throughput, of a, but I step up to a P30, and now I'm at 5,000 IOPS on a terabyte of disk, and uh, you know 200 megs per second to go ahead and, and run things through. So one of the things I run into, and I don't know how much you run into it with your clients, but you know, we'll sit down and we'll have conversations and we'll start talking about things like storage, whether it's either a, a platform kind of thing, right? So I need to use that object-based storage, or you know, it's an IaaS thing with, with VMs, and we start talking about throughput and I/O and everything else, and. 95, 99% of the folks, they have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I just want to get a VM and I just want to know how much it costs me. Well, if we don't know, it might cost you a whole bunch more than it needs to. Because if I put you in a P30 versus like an S30, because maybe you only needed standard disk and it just needed to be in a managed tier, there's a meaningful difference in price there over time, especially when we're having that storage. Allocated, you know, 24 7, 365 and, and stood up. So, one of the things you have to understand just from a deployment perspective and kind of a planning side of things is you really do have to know the performance characteristics that you're looking for out of these platforms. And that doesn't matter if you go to AWS or Azure, Google, or, or anybody else, really, right? To get the best kind of efficiencies out of there, you're going to want to make sure that you know all that stuff soup to nuts. And if you don't know it, spend the time to figure it out in your existing workloads before you just move it over to the other side and you feel like you know you're like literally throwing money into a fireplace exactly i've i've run into this a lot too because like you said it gets the whole mindset around standing up these VMs and how you architect it changes when you go to the cloud because typically in an on-prem environment a lot of times you just had that say on you would just attach disks to your servers you really wouldn't look at all of this stuff in that detail. So I agree, most people didn't know what throughput they needed. But when you get into these, another thing you had mentioned was a lot of these VMs, maybe you can only attach two disks to them. That means the most or the highest number of IOPS you'll ever be able to get is 1,500. You attach a P50 disk to it, you get 7,500 IOPS per disk, you're capping yourself immediately at 15,000 IOPS. There's nothing you can do to improve it, other than stand up a brand new VM with more disks. So not only do you have to be aware of, on the storage level, that number of IOPS that you need, but also on the VM, how many disks do you have to be able to attach to the VM to get the IOPS that you're looking for? So a lot of things that you just have to think about when you're looking at the whole standard versus premium storage and how those work with those VMs. Plan, 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 and and then... uh... (laughs) 
plan some more, right? Before you get in there and, and figure some of that out. Real quick to kind of close it out. So we have all these different storage tiers, right? And I have blobs and disks and you know, I can do standard, premium, all that kind of stuff. You mentioned the cold storage or, or cool storage a little bit, and I think that's worth taking a little bit of a dive into you just to kind of explain that a little bit more. So Azure with that regular storage, uh, let's call that the, the hot storage here, that's always optimized for storing any kind of data that's accessed frequently, right? And frequently means like really, you know, even if I haven't accessed it for five days, I need to access it now and have it come out in a kind of performant manner. That cool storage tier, it's optimized for storing data that's uh, infrequently accessed, long-lived. So if you think about kind of use cases for that, backups would be a great one, right? Especially like archival scenarios. Any kind of like media content that I need to push out. If I have legacy logs, scientific data, anything to do with like compliance, right? It just needs to be there just in case, but I don't need it right now. That's a great use case for that cooler storage with that lower cost component to it. So really you want to think about frequent versus seldom accessed, right? And that'll lay you into kind of what's a good candidate to go into those different tiers. Cost is going to be something that will probably play in. So that cool storage gets down to as low as uh, a penny per gig in some Azure regions. So check the pricing page because different regions have different pricing. One of the really cool things about that offering, if nobody's ever played with it, it's 100% compatible with the existing hot storage tier. And so if you've been doing things from an API side or you're using just kind of other features, so you, you know, you're just using things like Azure Storage Explorer to go ahead and access your storage accounts, awesome. You can keep doing that because it's 100% compatible. From a performance side, you actually see really similar performance for things like latency and throughput as, as, as far as when you're going ahead and putting it in there. You get that same durability same data replication, all that kind of stuff, scalability, security, blah, 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 all that. One of the interesting things is the availability is actually a little bit lower uh, for the cool access tier. So anything in that hot, you're at three nines. You're only at two nines in the cool access tier because you know what, if there is some platform problem, Microsoft's guaranteeing the redundancy. They're just not guaranteeing the, you know, the availability of it. So your data is going to be there. It might just not be there exactly when you want it to be, uh, especially Especially with only 99% availability, so you, you, you know you might want to keep that in mind too as you're architecting and putting things together. Sounds good. Well, I think that about does it for time. So we'll wrap it up for today and catch up with you again next week. Great. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks, Scott. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.